Tonight, the high-profile executive behind a fallen fashion empire, Peter Nygaard, convicted of sexual assault. The jury has spoken. The Canadian businessman found guilty on four counts. There's something evil in there. There's something perverse. There's something sick. The reaction and the relief for victims. This is a battle won in a much bigger war. More Canadians get out of Gaza. We can't wait to see his face. The wrath of border crossing reopens. As calls grow stronger for a ceasefire and the release of hostages. Plus, a former NHL coach opens up about facing adversity off the ice. Once I started doing it, all the emotions kept coming back. How Ted Nolan is tackling his toughest opponent yet. National News with Heather Butts. Good evening, former fashion mogul Peter Nygaard, who once led a billion dollar clothing brand, has a new label tonight guilty, and his son wasted no time passing his own judgment. We are dealing with a systematic monster who used his business talents for um, evil. A Toronto jury found Nygaard guilty of four counts of sexual assault, handing down the verdict on their fifth day of deliberations. This is the first criminal conviction against the 82-year-old who is still facing charges in other Canadian cities and the U.S. CTV's Kamal Karamali with reaction from the courthouse. Guilty. Guilty for you. A wave of relief outside the Ontario Superior Courthouse. I'm so proud of you. Therapist Shannon Mahoney making the phone call Peter Nygaard's victims have been waiting for. The former Canadian fashion mogul guilty on four counts of sexual assault. Nygaard showing no emotion as the jurors handed down the verdict following five days of deliberations. To actually hear it, it it's just a, a very, very good shock. The 82-year-old transported from the courthouse back to jail where he'll be awaiting sentencing. He has more formal accusations than Epstein, Weinstein and Cosby combined. Today, a bittersweet victory for Nygaard's son, Kai, who said he'd been warning the public of his father's alleged actions for years. It's not a good brand association to be the son of a monster. I have zero benefit from this other than knowing that one more child won't be affected. One more woman won't be affected. Nygaard accused of attacking women in a private bedroom suite at his Toronto office building between the 1980s to the mid-2000s. Everyone who came forward here is uh, to be commended. Although found guilty on four counts, Nygaard was acquitted of a fifth count of sexual assault and a charge of forcible confinement. His lawyer now considering an appeal. Mr. Nygaard is, uh, is frail, has uh, numerous health challenges, and that will be part of the uh, position taken. Peter Nygaard is still facing criminal charges in three other jurisdictions, including the United States. None of those charges in those jurisdictions have been tested in court. Thank you. But for his victims, a feeling of justice. We did it. Now hoping to focus on healing. Kamel Karamali, CTV News, Toronto. Police are dealing with rising Islamophobia and anti-Semitism since war broke out between Hamas and Israel. Today, there was another chilling attack. For the third time this week, a Jewish school in Montreal was hit by bullets. CTV's Matt Gilmore has the disturbing details. For the Jewish community in Cote de Neige, it's deja vu. Everybody feels a bit nervous, of course. I mean, you're living right next door to where bullet shots were fired. The target, Yeshiva Gadola School of Montreal, one of two Jewish schools also hit by gunfire on Thursday. In all three incidents, the buildings were empty and no one was hurt. For the second time in less than 72 hours, our school, Yeshiva Godola of Montreal, has been the target of a terrorist attack. I say again, a terrorist attack. It's another in a string of violent incidents targeting Montreal's Jewish community. We began last week with a video 
of an imam calling for the murder of Jews. Then we saw the firebombing at Beth Tikva Synagogue in Dollar in the Jewish Community Center in Dollar. Then we saw the shootings at two schools uh, last week. We saw an attack on Jewish students at Concordia University. And now we see another shooting. The Jewish community has been attacked repeatedly. Mayor Valerie Plant is once again calling for calm, condemning the escalating violence. We can have those conversations with respect and not using fear and absolutely not having uh, this kind of uh, a violent act towards a community. Sunday is a school day for the Jewish community and children aged 2 to 18 were scheduled to start arriving less than two hours after neighbors reported hearing the sound of gunshots. They want to try and scare us into closing our schools into not educating our children. They will fail. The shooting is being investigated by the Montreal Police Hate Crimes and Incidents Division. So far, no arrests have been made. Matt Gilmore, CTV News. More than 200 Canadian citizens, residents and their families got out of Gaza today. Palestinians trapped inside face desperation and despair. Gaza's largest hospital has been plunged into darkness as Israel and Hamas trade fire and blame for this humanitarian crisis. CTV's Jeremy Sharon reports. As intense fighting in Gaza persists into the night, today, relief for desperate Canadians as the Rafah border crossing reopened. Global Affairs confirms 234 people with ties to Canada left Gaza today. This Ontario woman's father was one of them. It was a, a hectic uh, few hours, to be honest. We were relieved uh, to hear that my father, uh, along with uh, uh, many Canadians, were finally finally able to cross over to the Egyptian side. Others here at home have family still stuck in the enclave. Unfortunately, nowhere is safe, so they're just, they sit until, until this is over, until ceasefire is called and they can go back to their homes or to the rubbles where their homes used to be. Heavy fighting raging near the Al Shifa hospital, now out of service since losing power yesterday. Kids and the infants, the newborns in the ICU are facing death. It's just indescribable what these people are going through and the doctors are going through. You've got to get those uh, wounded and sick people out of those hospitals and into some place where it's safe. Palestinian health officials reject a claim by Israel that it's offered to evacuate babies, saying fighting just outside hospital doors has continued today. But Palestinian families like this one, who narrowly escaped gunfire near the Al Shifa hospital, say they have nowhere to go. We thought the hospital was a safe place, she says. If we had stayed another five minutes, we would have been killed. They started to bomb us, and we ran away from Al Shifa. Tonight, the Israeli military says it's delivered emergency fuel, but that Hamas has stopped it from getting to the hospital. We offered actually. Uh, last night to give them uh, enough fuel to operate the hospital, operate the incubators and so on, because we have we have obviously no battle with patients or with civilians at all. Now there's word tonight Hamas has suspended hostage negotiations over fighting near the hospital. More than 200 were captured by Hamas on October 7th. Heather. Jeremy, thank you. And those hostages, including kids and the elderly snatched by Hamas, have been languishing in Gaza for 37 agonizing days now. Half a world away, Canadians called for their release, while others demanded a ceasefire. CTV's Tony Grace now on today's protests. Bring them home! Bring them home! At this park in Toronto, thousands of voices for the hostages who can't be heard. On October 7th, Kineret, my aunt, was brutally murdered by Hamas terrorists. From Mayan Shavit, whose aunt was killed, two other relatives kidnapped. Right now it's more anger that is not enough being done from the rest of the world to release innocent peoples. We must do everything possible to return these innocent people to their families. From the Ukrainian community, living through war on another front, and from an Iranian Canadian... I can feel their pain. ...who says he was a political prisoner of the Iranian regime, which supports Hamas. This is not two different fights. This is the same fight. We are fighting together. And along with their messages today, calls to stand up to a rising number of acts of hate and anti-Semitism across the country. We're proud to be Jewish. We're proud to be part of the Toronto community. 
uh, and we can't live under a constant fear and threat. Down the street, a different appeal. Palestinian flags and calls for Canada to push for a ceasefire. And for people then, they're being killed there like the kids and the, the, the crime that's happening in hospitals, so that's not acceptable at all. Free, free, free a plea echoed in other cities from the steps of Parliament Hill to Montreal and Winnipeg. Coordinated days of solidarity in troubling times. People are being divided more and more on either side. Competing calls for the world to listen and put humanity. Such a basic human rights ask, it is an immediate ceasefire. At the top of the agenda. There is no ceasefire until we see our people back. In a war where every weekend, more emotional battle lines emerge on the home front. Hallelujah. Tony Grace, CTV News, Toronto. Five premiers are turning up the heat on the federal government, demanding Ottawa remove the carbon tax from all forms of home heating. CTV's Colton Prail on the open letter and the provincial push for fairness. And it cost me $4,123. That's over $2,000 different. Nicole Lindsay is bracing for winter and the eventual oil home heating bill that will cost her family thousands. It's very expensive. It's, uh, it's hell, actually. Last year, her heating bill doubled. This year, she expects it will be even higher, and the carbon tax rebate doesn't offer much comfort. Sure, it, it's going to help at 250, but it's, it's not like I can whoopee whoopee with that. I talked to many people; they don't know what they're going to do this year, and uh, the carbon tax is just—it's killing us. Now, five premiers have sent an open letter to the prime minister, repeating their calls to exempt all forms of home heating from the carbon tax. All this is doing is just causing unfairness, making life less affordable, and really harming our most vulnerable as we get into the winter season. In Canada, the majority of homes heated by oil are in PEI in Nova Scotia. But the main source relied on by four provinces is natural gas, where the cost per gigajoule is roughly three times cheaper. Critics counter any exemptions to the carbon tax only diminish Canada's ability to hit its environmental targets, while offering people little long-term financial support. That's going to poke a, a big hole in the carbon tax's ability to incentivize switching from fossil fuel-based technologies to low carbon or zero carbon technology. The federal government has repeatedly said it's not considering any additional carve outs to the carbon tax, even as political pressure mounts and experts question if the policy is still doing its job. Heather. All right, Colton, thanks. Authorities in Iceland are preparing for a volcanic eruption following a series of earthquakes. Officials say there is considerable risk of an eruption in the southwest part of the island. Thousands of residents were ordered to evacuate the town of Grindavik Friday night. Iceland has seen several eruptions in unpopulated areas of the country in recent years. Coming up, employers dial back. We are in a period of uncertainty in our economy. Job seekers face a chill this holiday season. Plus, a girl's courage turns a classroom into a stage for mental health awareness. Remembrance Day has passed, and for many, thoughts now turn to the upcoming holiday season. Christmas markets like this one today in New Brunswick are beginning to pop up as shoppers kick off their annual gift-giving ritual. But as CTV's Manitoba Bureau Chief Jill Makashan reports, there are signs retailers may be losing faith in the holidays. At the haberdashery, owner Luke Nolan wears many hats. Everything from the bookkeeping to <laughs> ordering to everything. Sales and stocking, it's all him. He's the only employee, and while business has been improving since the pandemic, inflation has led to new concerns. From what I've noticed, more people are uh, putting their money towards food, whether that's eating out or grocery stores and things like that. And I think the retail is, is kind of gone online. For all those reasons, it seems fewer Canadian retailers are looking to bulk up their staff for the holiday season. Job finding website Indeed found Canadian postings for seasonal holiday jobs are down 30% from a year ago. It follows another survey which found retail spending dollars could reach a five year low over the holidays, with the average shopper expected to spend about $1,300. 
What all that means is we are in a period of uncertainty in our economy. And as employers, uh, retailers and others involved in holiday hiring, they too are looking and trying to make judgments as to what kind of uptake are they going to see from consumers. A softening economy seems to be translating into a softening in the hiring process, seasonally. But what is still needed is regular employees who can work more hours beyond the holidays. And that is still a challenge for those searching. I'd rather have, you know, a team of three people who are in here 20 hours a week. They're dedicated. At the haberdashery, with the cold settling in, Nolan knows the customers are coming. He will work longer hours to accommodate, but he still has no plans to hire more help. Jill Mackishon, CTV News, Winnipeg. The furniture retailer founded by former Toronto Mayor Mel Lastman plans to restructure under bankruptcy protection. Uh, Bad Boy stores will remain open. At this one today, customers told CTV News they haven't received their deliveries nor their money back. Still ahead. A life in two worlds as an Indigenous NHL coach. Canadians have turned to CTV National News for more than 60 years. And now there's a new national newscast at 5.30. It's more of the news you trust. More of the experience you rely on. Watch Canada's number one national news now at 5.30 and 11. A major shakeup by the NHL's Edmonton Oilers after a sluggish start derailed preseason predictions as a Stanley Cup favorite. Both head coach Jay Woodcroft and assistant coach Dave Manson were fired. The team has struggled in the standings, sitting second last in the entire league. Chris Knobloch takes over behind the bench, marking his first time as head coach in the NHL. Ted Nolan is no longer on the bench in the NHL, but the Coach of the Year recipient hasn't stopped guiding players. In a new memoir, the Ojibwe hockey great describes how he fought his way to the top, only to now face his biggest battle. In tonight's Indigenous Circle, CTV's Donna Sound on how he's proving to be a hero once again. Skate, skate. Hockey is all about beating the odds. Ted Nolan fought his way to the minors, to being a player in the NHL, to coaching in the NHL. Now he's in the biggest fight of his life. I was uh, diagnosed with, uh, uh, with multiple myeloma. It, 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 it was really hard. Uh, because now you couldn't just drop your gloves or you couldn't hit somebody. You, couldn't, uh, I mean, you, you had no control. He is recovering from a stem cell transplant. It uh, makes, makes, makes all the other stuff easy. His wife and rock Sandra is how he got through the tough days. You just have to really maintain that, that attitude. If you don't have the attitude, boy, you're, you're done. I'm uh, hopefully out of the woods here shortly. There's a one in 4,000 chance of making it to the NHL. The odds of becoming an NHL coach, many would say, are even higher. Nolan has beaten both those odds, making it to the NHL in 1981. Ted Nolan. He won the Jack Adams Coach of the Year Award in 1997, but was fired by the Buffalo Sabres soon after. I don't want to talk. So what's a good excuse to give to First Nation people? Oh, he's drunk at practice. Then I started hearing that rumor. He shares the gritty truth about how he got there in his new memoir, Life in Two Worlds. Nolan is very candid in the book about the racism he faced and how he got through it. It's a book not just for a hockey fan. He describes growing up in a small house on the Garden River Reserve with his 11 siblings. The food was scarce, but the love from his family is what fed him and is what he brought to his unique style of coaching. I, used to, I remember telling my friend, I, said, I, I think I'm the special one. I think my, my parents like me the best. Then I heard my sister say the same thing, and I heard my brother say the same thing. Nolan's family has become its own hockey dynasty. His two sons, Brandon and Jordan, both playing in the NHL, with the youngest bringing home three Stanley Cup rings. He's all about family, and it's through their love that will pull him through his biggest fight. Donna Sound, CTV News, Niagara on the Lake. After the break, life lessons from a young student. If you don't talk about it, 
more people will feel alone. How facing fears helps to protect your mental health. We leave you tonight with a bold journey inspired by a student. 11-year-old Quinn taught herself to transform fear into fuel and produced a master class in her toughest moments. CTV's Adam Sawatsky explains. If Quinn Shireen's not expressing herself creatively, she's likely challenging herself physically and always showing compassion towards others. One of those students that you're really happy to teach, the kind you hope for that's in your class. While Sarah Hallett remembers Quinn as a kind and confident leader in class, Quinn will never forget what her grade five teacher assigned her that day. Do you do a project on something that you're interested in? Although there were countless subjects Quinn could have chosen, she had no doubt which one topic to pursue. Anxiety. Anxiety? Yeah. The 11-year-old says she wanted to explore the mental health issue she'd been experiencing for a couple years. For me, it feels like my stomach drops, such as butterflies. It's like living with this worry monster that Quinn's psychologist asked her to craft out of clay that bombards your brain with a debilitating amount of negativity. And he's the one that you talk back to. And there was a lot to debate when Quinn learned she would have to present her anxiety project in front of the whole class. Quinn was really anxious about making the presentation and sharing something that is so personal to her was very brave. But Quinn was determined to face her fears in the hopes that others would feel more comfortable facing theirs. And that if you don't talk about it, more people will feel alone. So Quinn created a 16-page slideshow, which explored the science behind anxiety, offered solutions to overcome it, and despite all the things that worry monster incessantly warned her would go wrong. I felt a bit nervous when I was standing there, and then as soon as I started speaking, I was like, oh, okay, this is good. The presentation went so well, Sarah says, it inspired some of the other students to open up about their mental health, too. It also gives them inspiration to know that, hey, she's doing really well despite this. I can do really well with this as well. A big lesson from a young person about finding the courage to vanquish the worry monster in all of us. Facing your fears can be scary, but once you face them, they won't be your fears anymore. Adam Sawatsky, CTV News, Esquimalt. That is our show for this Sunday. For those celebrating, happy Diwali. I'm Heather Butts. Thank you for watching. Sandy Ronaldo will be here tomorrow for CTV's new national newscast at 530, followed by the evening newscast with Omar Sachedina. Good night. Canadians have turned to CTV National News for more than 60 years. And now there's a new national newscast at 5.30. It's more of the news you trust. More of the experience you rely on. Watch Canada's number one national news now at 5.30 and 11.